We open with Sean Connery explaining the very broad premise about people living down through the centuries until the time of the gathering, when the battle to the last man standing happens. And it's coming to pay-per-view! On a similar subject, we're here at Madison Square Garden for a big professional wrestling match where an unenthused man in a trench coat watches. He doesn't want this. He wants to think about fighting in the foggy hills of Scotland in full-on regalia. Finally, he leaves all that wrestling stuff behind to head down to the parking garage where a man who calls him McLeod is waiting. Guess he's tired of waiting. McLeod pulls out his own sword, and quickly this turns into a fight, and no Errol Flynn stuff either. I don't know why I said that. Errol Flynn died back when Eisenhower was president, but it's been established as the go-to for discussion of traditional swashbuckler technique for films. This isn't that. This isn't a dashing contest to master the blade. This is two men in a parking structure trying to murder each other with sharp things. McLeod loses his sword under one of the cars, but improvises until he can finally claim it, mostly while this guy is showing off. His mistake. There's no silver medal for coming in second. For one thing, you'd just fall off without a neck. With that, lightning-like tendrils crawl out of the guy. This was still the days when you might use hand-drawn animation for special effects, like in Forbidden Planet. Everything goes nuts, cars exploding, hoses unraveling, and McLeod crying out before he collapses, desperately in need of a cigarette. As McLeod has the good sense to hide the murder weapon when he hears sirens, we cut to him in long-ago days of Scotland, ready to head off into battle for the first time. His girlfriend goes running out to give him some flowers and make clear how much she loves him, but not sure if it'll be much comfort when they get out there. The sky is not looking good at all. And also, there's an angry giant wearing a skull. He makes clear to the leader of this rival clan that he's fighting for them only because Connor, our hero, is his to kill. This leads to McLeod being confused that not only is no one attacking him, but they're actively avoiding fighting him. And it's not like he's got a fearsome reputation keeping them away. That's when he sees the giant coming his way. He's like, I came here to face someone. And next thing he knows, it's a boss fight. And it's not even sporting. McLeod gets stabbed almost immediately. And it's only everyone else getting in the way that stops him from getting his head chopped off. I rather imagine this is what it's like to go to a Scottish pub. In the present, McLeod gets into his convertible and races out of there, but the cops block the exit before he can escape. And the way this guy reacts, you'd think he'd done something where a cop was a victim. No, this guy just seems to really love pushing people around, just because he can. Don't move, pal. Don't even breathe. Ah, this period. After Errol Flynn, but before cell phone cameras. Back in Scotland in the past, McLeod is on his deathbed, and his girlfriend is weeping over him as he's given last rites. <laughs> he's a Highlander by God. The last sound he hears shall not be that of a wailing woman. Let him die at peace, while we play the bagpipes. It is a lovely instrument. I mean, you have to respect anyone who looks at those wailing pipes and says, What am I going to call those drones? It's just an empty, endless noise, you geet. Returning to future New York, we have Brenda with police forensics who arrives to discover the headless body. Make an arrest? No, we're questioning some guy named Nash. We expect he'll be completely cooperative, having roughed him up, handcuffed him, and put a gun to his head. Officer Friendly's actually down here right now, says that according to the ME, whatever made the cut that gave him too ambitious of a haircut was razor sharp. Well, isn't it interesting that she finds the sword, a Toledo Salamanca, worth about a million dollars, or approximately the same amount of money Robert Redford would pay to have sex with your wife? There's no such sword as the Toledo Salamanca, but the point of it is the rarity and her knowledge of its rarity. Toledo swords were renowned, especially during the Renaissance, being strong yet flexible blades. Toledo steel thus became a synonymous term with weapons of extremely high quality, essentially the Xerox, Kleenex, and Band-Aid of its time. So the concept being that this was steel made to the same level of quality as that used in Toledo, except the sword was actually made in Salamanca, indicating its rarity in the world of Highlander. 
Yes. I am a nerd. The detective swings by where McLeod, going by the name Russell Nash, is being held for questioning. He shows him the sword and offers the theory that this fight was over the sale of the sword, Nash being an antique dealer. McLeod isn't being helpful, so the cop who had held a cocked revolver to the head of someone who is just being brought in for questioning asks if he's gay, and I don't mean politely, in an online gamer who just lost a third match kind of way. McLeod, who has no doubt been called worse, is unfazed. In fact, his reaction shows this cop isn't worth the energy of being loathed, like this is an idiot child and nothing more can be expected of him but to embarrass himself. Finally, the dipshit just takes a swing at him, and that ends this conversation. Keep it up and you'll make captain in no time. Hearing the news of the murder, we find our giant friend in the present day, who I will call the Kurgan to save time. Hey, uh... If there's anything you need, you know, broad, so blow, just dial O, huh? Oh, they have a concierge. I had no idea this was such a fine establishment. In the privacy of his room, the Kurgan assembles his broadsword, and just in time for a visitor. Hi. I'm Candy. <sighs> of course you are. One thing that I don't think gets mentioned about being Generation X is having come of age during the 1980s. So when you watch old movies and shows, there's this question of why does this objectively hideous hair and or outfit somehow look hot? Oh yeah, Pavlov. Trust me, those of you going through puberty during the AI art age, in about 20 years you're going to wonder why you're secretly turned on by extra fingers. Meanwhile, Brenda gets some tiny metal fragments from the body and does an analysis on them, and the results are shocking. She decides to go back and examine the scene of the crime for more evidence, unaware that McLeod is there to retrieve his sword. She gets some more fragments, but hears him rustling around, so when he comes into the same bar and mentions Madison Square Garden, she wonders if he's a stalker or something. The fact he soon grabs her and yanks her into an alley doesn't help, but it's actually because... See, that's what a stalker looks like, Brenda. As the Kurgan proceeds to beat the crap out of McLeod, he says, There can be only one, something he'd said when they first met back in Scotland. She has tons of questions for McLeod afterwards, but he just says that she has only one life, so stop following him. While she noodles on that, we have a flashback where McLeod's friends are concerned that he's recovered from a mortal wound. I stay as the devil in him. Nah, trust me, lady. I know what it looks like when your partner has the devil in them. If it happens, you'll know. Everyone seems to be coming around to her point of view. Anyway. I understand this is just a typical weekend in Scotland, right? Fortunately, Angus steps in, saying that Connor McLeod is going to be banished. No! Burn How angry do you think God would be if he performed a miracle and restored someone who was dying to life and the response was to burn them. And people wonder why I don't do flashy things anymore. That's it. From now on, it's nothing but pictures on grilled cheese sandwiches. So McLeod wanders away, until in the present day, we see him head back to his shop. He's got quite a place here. Uh, that cop should have seen this place before he knew what he was messing with. You don't get on the bad side of someone like this. This, this guy could probably afford many lawyers. He's probably got a gun that fires lawyers. Back in Scotland, McLeod has set up a new life for himself, even has a new love who meets his criteria, not wanting to see him set on fire. Well, the afterglow of the two boning in the field is interrupted by Ramirez, chief metallurgist to King Charles V of Spain. As he approaches, the sky gets ugly, just like when McLeod and the Kurgan met on the battlefield. It's called the quickening, the strange feeling that their kind feel around each other, and other things. Note for any diehard fans of the franchise, when I speak about the quickening when reviewing this film, I'm only referring to how it is described in this film, okay? Nothing having to do with any of the stuff that comes later on. Back in New York, Brenda slips in to look at McLeod's file while he looks at a book that she'd written about ancient sword making and the metallurgy, which naturally brings us back to Ramirez, which is always a good thing. Sean Connery may not have always been in good movies, but no one ever said, Connery's performance is what drags this movie down. 
You look like a woman, you stupid haggis. Uh, maybe change out of your skirt before throwing around that accusation. McLeod starts getting hostile until Ramirez finally just pitches him into the lock so he'll learn. This is to help McLeod realize that he's immortal. He can sink underwater and be just fine. No chance of drowning. Still, he is not happy and takes a swipe at Ramirez when he comes ashore. Crude and slow, clansman. Your attack was no better than that of a clumsy child. Plus, the editor's on my side. He explains that this is simply what McLeod is. They don't know why they are like this, but they are. And that means that other people will fear them. He explains this is just what McLeod simply is. They don't know why they are like this, but they are. And that means other people will fear them. Whenever I hear this explanation, I'm always struck by something that the director's commentary on Highlander 2 had. That's a film where the question of why they are this way is answered. Also, people generally hate that movie and that answer. The conclusion was that it's because even though people say they want to know, they don't really want to know. Now, the reason why that stuck with me is because of the arrogance of that lesson. I had an answer. People hated it. Ergo, they're the ones with the problem. I'm not saying the audience is always right on what a work should be, but an audience does always know what it is they want and whether or not they've gotten it. 